class today. There may be a few people playing, turning in late and taking some of the late keys um, um, at the point. So I won't be discussing anything that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe I'll try doing that um, in the future. So. Um, um, so, um, so I didn't post this on on the discussion group, but I um, I think I chance to it. But the next homework assignment has been uh, posted. Um, <coughs> Um, so this one is basically going to be on these, um, on the previous two lectures, and on this one. So you're going to actually, um, um, you're going to take some documents, and you'll, um, uh, um, you'll create the k-grams for the documents, um, and then you'll do some min hashing with those k-grams, like we talked about on Monday, and then you'll do some locality sensitive hashing. Based on, on those on those min hashing vectors, to quickly find you know which ones are similar. So there are only going to be four documents, so you won't totally get to see how locality sense of hashing really starts to scale things up. But you'll get to kind of play with, with some of these things. Um, uh, um, so I'll just make a note: in the past, um, a certain fraction of the class has had some trouble in creating um, the k-grams, the first part. Um, with this assignment. So, you know, the people who have a strong computer science background, this is some version of parsing, and it's, it's not too hard. If you haven't parsed something before, then, you know, the first time you do it, may, uh, you know, it might take a little longer. So, um, so and also with the min hashing, you have to create um, a hash function particular to the text. This has also caused some issues. So, you know, if, if you're unfamiliar with CS background, um, you know, look at these things and ask the TAs questions early if you have questions about these. Um, um, so, um, so this one is due um, February 19th, so you have roughly um, like three weeks to do it, so it should, should be fine. Um, okay. Um, and the other thing to remember, the, um, the proposal is due on uh, Monday, so I discussed this um, next Monday. I just discussed this a little bit last Monday, so I won't say too much more about this. Um, where my office hours are tomorrow. Um, I, had, I had to change the time from the first time I announced them from 1.30 to 2.30. Um, this time, I imagine there may be people coming in with questions. Um, I'll probably be able to ask and you know, entertain people until around 3 or so. And if these times don't work, then feel free to send me an email or send me an email anyway about it as a preview. All right, so um, um, let's see. So in the last few lectures, we talked about um, how to start with some documents, how to um, convert these documents into sets, and this was using these ideas of these k-grams, and this required um, some modeling choices. So there's no right way, no wrong way to do this. We need to make some modeling choices in order to do this, but you're able to convert these documents into sets. Um, as we talked about, we can compare these sets using the um, Jacquard similarity or the Jacquard distance, but Calculating these similarity distances between the sets can be um, kind of cumbersome, especially if the sets are very large. Um, so then what we talked about on Monday was how to turn these sets into um, vectors. And, um, and so this was with this technique called min-hashing. And so then you could compare these vectors with something that looked like the Hamming similarity. Um, basically the Hamming similarity, and this approximated the Jacquard similarity. And so the Hamming similarity, because these vectors may be much smaller than the sets, then you could hopefully compute this much faster. Right? So 
Um, um, so just as a reminder, you, you had something where um, you may have had, um, so, the, um, so you start with these different sets, S1, S2, S3, up to S, up to Sn, and for each of these sets, you have these K hash functions. And so these K hash functions are allowing you to, to kind of approximate a, a permutation of all the elements in the set. And so for each hash function, you hash all the elements in the set, and you took the one whichever gave the minimum value out of the hash function, right? So set one for hash function one may have had a value of one. This may have been seven. This may have been eight. This may have been one. Hash function two may have been two. May have been 14. May have been um, uh, 12. This may have been three. You know, and then for hash function k, may have been four, four, six, four. Okay, so then the Hamming distance between these, which approximated the Jacquard distance um, um, between two sets, was one over k times the um, number of hash functions where h a equals d <coughs> to b. Right, so there are k different hash functions, and we approximate the Jacquard similarity where by one over k times the number of number of hash functions where these are equal. Right. So if we just had these three hash functions, one, two, and k, then set one. And n, they have this 1 in common, so this counts as 1. They have this 4 in common, but not this 2 and 3 in common. So then you would get 2 out of a total of 3 things. So the Jacquard similarity is approximated by 2 thirds. Between sets 1 and 2, you get this one is not the same, not the same, the same. You approximate it by 1 third instead. Okay? So this is, this is basically the Hamming similarity that we discussed briefly, um, I think that was on last week's Wednesday, um, between these two vectors. So each of the, each of the sets is now represented as, as this vector here. Right? And we wrote this vector as, as this big M, and for a hash function i, this was value um, mi in this vector. Now each of these sets becomes a vector, and each of these sets, remember, was coming from one of these documents. So it's it's actually a pretty simple algorithm to create this min hashing, but we kind of went through this lengthy progression to getting there through this idea of a matrix and the permutations, because it kind of explains why doing this works. But the actual algorithm was a couple of, of a one or two for loops, depending on how you're how you're doing it. It's a pretty simple algorithm of actually how to create these vectors once you have the sets. Okay, so now, so, but we've talked about doing this for kind of just the small number of documents we want to compare, a pair of these documents. Um, but really, we're often faced with a situation where the number of these documents that we have n, where we have n is is really big. Um, so say like one million. And so this is equal to the um, um, number of documents. So, so think instead of each document is like a web page. We want to find similar web pages. There are lots and lots of web pages out there. So now there are two kind of key questions we want to ask that we haven't really answered yet, um, at least how to do efficiently, is Which of the documents are um, similar to each other? And so, and two, um, given a um, query document, Q, 
which um, documents are um, uh, um, are similar to Q. Okay. So, given this this conversion after we've pre-processed all these documents to sets to vectors, we can now use the, the Hamming distance to actually Hamming similarity to answer this pretty quickly for any pair of documents. How similar are they? But these questions are still seem like like they might be hard, especially if n is equal to 1 million, right? So if we want to say which documents are similar, we kind of, seems like we need to check all pairs of documents, right? We have to, and 1 million squared is, is, is going to be too long, right? Um, was 1 million squared, was that uh, 1 trillion, is that right? So um, it's a really large number, um, so we don't want to do that. Um, yeah, trillion, trillion, yeah, so it's one trillion <coughs> things we need to check for. One trillion divided by two, but that's still a really big number. Okay, so, um, and, and given one query document, we want to quickly see if it's similar to any of the other query documents, or to any of the other documents that are in set, but we have one million of these, so we don't want to have to check all one million every time we have a query document. We only, like, we'd like to be able to do this very quickly. Um, and so, so, it, um, so if we do this naively, um, the naive solution is basically going to be n squared, or say n squared over 2, and the naive solution for this is, is the amount of checks we need to do is basically going to be n. We have to check against every dot. So we want to somehow do something smarter than this. So, this, so some of you have probably encountered a question like this before. Um, so, for um, for instance, if if all of the if all of the vectors are instead of being these k-dimensional vectors, they're they're just a single value, then you can do this you can you can do this much more quickly, right? So, if, especially this this second question, right? So. If, if, if they're only a one value, then you can use something like a binary tree, right, to quickly search for something, something that's quick. Um, so binary trees are built on this one-dimensional, these one-dimensional values. If you get these k-dimensional vectors, this is all of a sudden much harder. So, 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 so do people have kind of some, some, uh, some notions of how you do this for these higher dimensional vectors. Kind of. Do you want to counter these problems before? I know a few of you have. Any ideas? One way I can use an inverted file. An inverted file. So instead of uh, sets of vectors, you have a list of files that have these terms. You can check them that way, and then you can just kind of divide them the same set. Yeah, okay, so you, so you can do something like this inverted index. Um, so I'm not going to, I'll, I'll mention this a, much later in class when we, when we talk about uh, MapReduce maybe. Um, but so, so basically, the, the, this is using actually the set structure, not the vector structure. It's, it's for every element of the set, it's trying to. You have a query, you look at all the elements in the set, you find all the sets that have similar elements, and you then you check those instead of everything. Um, so it's, it's kind of bypassing this vector structure, and if the sets are very large, it just becomes hard to do. If you have, if your query is like a keyword, like in, in Google, you can do something like this. But this is not really on the right, not really on the right path. This is a good, um, um, this is, on um, the um, good suggestion. So, um, so any other ideas? So, so how about if, if instead of just one-dimensional values, right? So if if these values, if these vectors, are actually you want to find similar things, and and they were just one-dimensional values, right? Then just to 
be a little bit more clear, you, what you can do is you can store all of them in sorted order, right? So set one may have a value one, set set two had a value seven, set three had a value eight, and set um, n had a value one. These are in the same spot. You sorted them, you can build a binary tree on, on top of these and quickly search down to find the nearest one. If you want to find this, all the similar things, they're in sorted order, you just find the ones which are right next to each other, those are the similar ones. Now, what if instead of a one-dimensional value along here, I have now just, just a two-dimensional value? I had a vector with two values in it. Uh, what could I do? Build a KD tree. Uh, um, you can build a KD tree, good. Um, right, so, so how a KD tree works is it thinks each of these documents now has two values. So you have like an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, and you can place like document S1 here. Um, if you use the the hash function two, then this was like one, two. Two is like uh, seven and 14. Three is like eight, eight and 12. And one is, uh, and set N is one and three. So this is here, something like this, right? So now you have them in a spatial layout. And instead of building a binary tree where you're essentially splitting things in half along the one axis, axis each time, you're splitting things first in one axis, and then you, this is one level of the tree, then the next level down, you split in this way. And you split each half, and you alternate x direction or y direction you split. And there's some variants of this in, um, in, in, uh, Next week, Wednesday, we'll talk about some variants of this. There are things called R trees and, um, and these range trees. And the problem is these work, these work when K is, say, between 2 and, say, 12. They work in fairly low dimensions. You can, you can work in, and there are ways to get them to work in higher dimensions, and we'll talk a little bit about this uh, on a week from Wednesday. But, these are kind of a medium dimension type type object really work well. You. Um, I was thinking if uh, this can this is only possible if sets have a similar kind of things inside. Only then you can split them into dimensions and then sort like that. So if you sort in each dimension and then you somehow want to combine them together. So this is going to be somewhat along the ideas we'll do today. So. I, how do you combine these different sort of orders? That's, that's kind of a tricky part, right? So you can sort in each dimension and then somehow glue these together, right? One of the other kind of rough ideas that's similar to this, which we're gonna base this on, is to put down some sort of grid, right? And so the idea is that you kind of just grid up this entire space here in, so you can assume that in these documents, I'll draw them think of these as these points in black here. Okay, so I, I've, I, I break up the x coordinate into these intervals, and I also break up the y coordinate in these intervals. And I didn't do a very good example, so let's, so now, if, now if two points fall in the same grid cell, then they're kind of close to each other. So I'm using Euclidean distance now, not really the Hamming distance, but the Hamming distance will work in a way that's somewhat similar. They need to be exactly the same for Hamming distance, um, to make sense. Okay, so, so if they're close to each other, if they're in the same grid cell, then they're going to be somewhat close to each other. So essentially, each grid cell we can think of as a cell in a big hash function, and so we will. Um, so this grid, grid function, this grid cell will be indexed by two values. Say this is the x value is two and the y value is four, and we can have this index two four correspond to a cell in a one-dimensional hash function. We um, and we have a hash table 
we throw everything in the hash table, and if they're in the same cell, then, then they're similar to each other. The problem is going to be for points, say, like this, that are very close in Euclidean distance, but are not in the same grid cell. Okay, so you could even think about doing this in higher dimensions with more grid cells. Um, and this problem gets even worse in higher dimensions. In, in, uh, in two dimensions, you could do something, well, it doesn't need to be in the same grid cell, but it could be in any of the neighboring grid cells. Then I, I, I can check it. I can go and check the distance then. There should be too many points. Right? But, so if this, if this is the grid cell I'm concerned about, it has eight, it has eight neighbors here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? The problem is in <clears throat> when you go to high dimensions, this number of neighbors grows very quickly. Right? So when you get too many neighboring grid cells to deal with in high dimensions. So, this technique also breaks down in high dimensions. But we're going to do something kind of similar to this, and we're going to use some randomization to, um, to make it work. So it'll, it'll also be kind of a, um, it'll, it'll be a fairly simple algorithm again, but understanding why it works and how to tune the parameters of it um, will take the class to explain. So, and, and this technique is going to be called um, uh, locality um, um, sensitive hashing. And it's typically called just LSH. Okay. So, I'm going to start by kind of defining this more. Technically, what are the properties that you need to have a locality sense of hash function? I'll show, I'll, I'll show how the min hash function that we have for sets, for the Jacquard distance on sets, will qualify for this and how it fits in. And then I'll show how to use this and give some examples. And then, as time, show how to do it for, um, for Euclidean distance as well. So both of them are very, very symbolic. So, uh, so what we want is what's called a uh, locality preserving um, hash panel. Okay, so, it, so this will be a set of these hash functions, and we're going to draw a single hash function out of here and this will have some some probabilistic properties. And so we're going to say this for um, um, for a distance um, D. And you can think of actually between say A and B and we can think of D of A and B as being one minus some similarity between A and B. This is typically defined in using the distance, so I'll use this, this condition. So, um, <coughs> so it's going to have it's going to have uh, four parameters and and two um, and two properties, and I'll kind of write these up and then try and break these down and explain what they mean. So, it's going to have the probability that H A and H B have, have a collision, they hash to the same location. If this is greater than some parameter alpha, if the distance between A and B is less than some parameter gamma, and the probability that hash functions, you want this to be less than some beta, if the distance A and B is greater than the sum of the two. Okay, so if the points, what this says is if the points are far away from each other, you want the probability of them of colliding 
to be small, smaller than the sum parameter of beta. If they're close to each other, means close means that they're similar, you want the probability of collision to be high. Right? So when we talked earlier about these, what I call these random hash functions, you wanted, as long as A and B were any different at all, you wanted the probability of them plotting to be independent of how close they were. But now, the closer they are, if they're closer than some value, I want the probability to be high. And so, typically, this is defined with these threshold points, but really, it's a, it's a, um, it's a continuum here. Um, and so, so basically, the way to think about this is that. You're going to have a similarity S, which is 1 minus D. Okay? And so in the case of the in the case of the Jacquard similarity, and you're also so this is going to go from 0 to 1. And you're going to have the probability that H of A equals H of B. And this is also going to go from 0 to 1. Right, so with the Jacquard similarity, you're going to get a plot here, and it's going to look like this. Okay, so if the similarity is 1, meaning they're exactly the same, the hash functions will always collide. If the similarity is 0, they're never going to collide. Okay, so, so this is use the Jacquard similarity between A and B. Okay, so now, what is, what are these two properties saying? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to set both of these values to be some threshold tau. So then the similarity is going to be this 1 minus delta. So you're going to get this value here, tau go up with the similarity function, okay? So this distance is 1 minus the similarity. <laughs> and so it says if the distance is greater than gamma, that means that the, the similarity is small, so that means you're in this region, right? No, no, so, sorry, I've got that backwards, right? So if the similarity is is a uh, yeah. If the distance is small, means this means the similarity is big. Okay. So if this if the distance is small, that means it's smaller than than some value here. Uh, so it's smaller than. This that means the if the distance is smaller than gamma, that means that the similarity is going to be greater than one minus tau. So actually, this is going to be one minus tau here. So then the similarity is going to be in this region here, and so the probability of collision will be greater than alpha. So I can draw here, and I'm going to hit alpha. So I'm basically in this region here, so this is property one, I have a high similarity or small distance, and I have a high probability of collision. And so then property two, let's switch colors here. So then property two here means that I have a large distance, meaning a small similarity, and I have a small probability of collision. So, in the case of the Jacquard similarity, I don't always have that my similarity will have this nice blue curve, this, uh, something like a blue curve where it's a linear thing here. I can, this, this kind of more complicated definition is because you want to be able to apply this more generally. Um, but, so what I want to say is that if the, sim, if the similarity is high enough, 
I have a high probability of collision. If it's low enough, I have a low probability of collision. And I want to be able to set parameters where I can do this. So I want basically, um, so, this, um, so I want both of these regions to be as large as possible. Alpha, beta, same? So alpha, beta does not need to be the same okay. uh, for this to work. So we'll see with Euclidean distance that they won't be the same. Okay. So you'll see why you need to have this more general notion. I'll try and draw a similar picture for, for that. It's a little, little harder to get right. Um, okay, so, um, but this is true where you have this linear thing. So you have, this is um, um, linear for any um, um, similarity S um, where the, the probability of A equals is, is equal to S A B. Right, so for any similarity S that has this property, which we have for the Jacquard distance and the and min hashing, then you have this property, you get this blue line, and you can kind of analyze it like this. It'll be a, a little trickier for the Euclidean distance. Okay, so this is just the technical properties that you need, but this I've not explained at all how to use this yet. Okay, so let me try and I do this okay, so, so the idea is we want to do something like this grid approach over here, where if things fall in the same bin, being that the hash functions are, are the same, then we want to say that they're similar. So there are kind of two basic ways you can, you can think of doing this. Um, so we have a bunch of these hash functions, and this applies for any one hash function, so we want to use the set of all that, all these k hash functions that we have. Um, so, so one is we can check if for a and b they they um, always um, have h a equals. So this is one way you could think of doing it. The other is if for A and B um, any H A equals H B. Okay, so you, there are two kind of basic ways you could think of doing this. If they if they always fall in then this is kind of like this thing we're doing with the grid, where we're saying one dimension is one hash function, another dimension is another hash function, a third dimension is another hash function, and if they always fall in the same grid cell, then they, um, then these two elements, A and B, are similar. In fact, we can use this trick where each of these grid cells corresponds to an entry in a hash table, and so we can quickly look these up. So, so this one, is is very efficient because we can use a hash table to quickly find things where they always have the same match. But the problem is that, you know, even if they're pretty similar to each other, there probably is going to be some hash function where they don't match, right? There's some probability, you know, where they, you know, even if the distance is, uh, is is large, the similarity is, or even if the if the distance is small, the similarity is large, there's some probability of failure. I can only guarantee up to some alpha. Okay, so the other option is check if any of them match. So this means that the more I check, I'm gonna get um, I'm gonna have more possible candidates if any of them match. Um, so this, so this I can also do, you know. Um, I, I, I can check for any A, I can answer this second query fairly efficiently. Um, I can have these different hash tables, I can have K different hash tables and I can check each one and find 
hash A to each of the cells in the hash table and find all of the ones that hash there. The problem is I'm going to get a lot of these false positives. Okay, so I need to do something that's in between these two where I always have a collision and, I, and anyone has a collision. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to, there's a trick that goes in between them um, that's called banding. Okay, and so the idea is that you're going to have these K hash functions. Okay, and you're going to have some budget of K hash functions, depending on how much storage you, you're, you're willing to make, or you've, you've done min hashing already and you have a vector of size K, maybe it's 100. Um, you have some budget of hash functions, and you're going to want to do some like this and some kind of like this. So think of this guy as, um, as, as papa bear, this one as mama bear, this one's too hot, this one's too cold, you want to find do the baby bear version of hashing. This one should be somewhere in the middle. Okay. That makes any sense at all. Um, okay, so, so this one idea is that I'm going to have um, so I'm going to have B um, bands, and so let's call this Papa and this Mama. So B bands, each band will be doing, you know, the um, the technique of Papa Bear, and I'm going to have K. This be R equals K over B. Um, rows, and each of these will be doing um, the mama bear. Okay, so how's this going to work? So if I'm, so let's, let's say that, for example, I'm going to have k is equal to 15 here. I'm going to set the number of bands uh, to be equal to 5, and the number of rows to be equal to 3. So then I'm going to have these hash functions, um, h1, h2, h3, h4, h5, up to h11, h12, up to h15. Okay? And so the bands are going to look like this. So now I want to say is that two sets are similar as two if everything matches in these five hash functions. So if it's two